Hello everybody, how are you doing? This is Vicious. I hope you can say that you're doing well, and if not, at least by the end of this video, you can say that you're well informed. So what we're going to be doing today is focusing on the initial configuration of an Aruba S2500 switch. This is a full-blown tutorial video and also part of our vlog series about upgrading the home network to 10 gigabits on the cheap. The S2500 is a 24 or 48 port layer three managed switch, an enterprise grade switch. All the features are unlocked, with four SFP Plus ports for 10 gigabit connectivity. This switch was only $75 brand new on eBay, and I'm finding the PoE models used for about 100 bucks. So that is gonna be very difficult to beat. So since this is not your basic layer two dumb switch that you just plug in and use it, it is an enterprise grade switch, you're gonna to have to configure it. And when I searched online for any kind of tutorials on that, there just simply was not any. So that's what we're doing today, is showing you step-by-step -step on how to do that initial configuration. Now this was brand new, so I didn't have to do a factory reset, but I wanna show you how to do that. There's two buttons on the front of the switch, just like that factory reset option and do that first because you don't wanna to touch a switch until you've reset it because you have no idea what kind of settings are on there. Now for your convenience, I have timers on all these longer sets of waiting. That way you can have the footage sped up, but still know exactly about how long these steps take. So after that factory reset is done, which takes a little over three minutes, the next thing we wanna do is go back into our, the menu on the front of the switch using those two buttons and kick off the quick graphic interface setup option. Now, as soon as you click that, it's gonna kick off a feature where you have a 10 minute timer, exactly 10 minutes before it self terminates and it's gonna start DHCP services on the switch. And you have to plug into one of the front interfaces on the switch. Do not use the management interface in the back of the switch, that's for out of band management and it will not work for this. So once we have that DHCP service running, we're gonna go ahead and move over to our screen capture and actually move into how to do this from the computer. So in effort to give you a really good tutorial, I wanna show you all the things that can go wrong, stuff to look out for, AKA the catch 22s. The first thing I wanna do is tell you what IP address the switch is going to get. It's gonna get a 172.16.0.254 address. And it's running DHCP right now, so your computer will automatically pick up an IP address within that subnet unless you don't have DHCP set for your IP and instead you have a static IP. So you'll need to go into your ethernet adapter properties and change your IP v4 address to either be DHCP or give yourself a new static IP within that subnet. Now remember, if you don't get a brand new IP address right away, this is a good time to make use of your command prompt and use the IP config slash release and the IP config slash renew and that'll pull the new IP address right away for you. Now moving on to the next catch 22 that I had to suffer through, it's going to be the fact that this was an older switch because it was the original firmware. And even though I was able to communicate with the management interface, I wasn't able to actually reach the web graphic interface and configure it. I tried Firefox, I tried Chrome, I tried Internet Explorer, none of them were working quite right. I just couldn't actually see anything to change. It ended up being the solution to have it fixed for me was using Internet Explorer and enabling the compatibility view. Once I did that, I was able to get in there and actually start making my configurations. So that was the browser I had to use with the original old firmware. Now, after I updated the firmware, it was just the opposite. Compatibility view with IE no longer works and anything else does. So Firefox, Chrome, and IE without compatibility view actually work. Now, once you're in, you can see our basic configurations are here. We need to set our password for the administrator. We need to set a password for the enable mode, which is where your advanced configuration happens. We wanna set our time, and time is very important when it comes to authentication. And then here on the next page, we have to set the interfaces that are gonna be in either upstream or normal. DHCP or static IP, of course you want a static IP for this. So this is gonna be your management IP. So I'm setting 234 for our management IP, our subnet mask, our default gateway. Out of band management is that management port on the back. We don't have to set up an IP address for it. So I will skip it at this time and we do not have to assign any upstream ports even though it warns us against it. The upstream port is gonna create a trunk port for you and we can do that later during manual configuration. So before we move on and actually commit these changes, the next thing I want to do real quick is just show you how to bypass the HTTPS errors that you get for having an invalid certificate 
on each of the browsers. So we already showed how to do the one on Firefox. I'm also going to show you how to do this with Chrome. And lastly, I'm going to show you how to go into IE and either enable or disable the compatibility view. So while I'll show you some of those basics on screen, let's talk about a little bit of the why behind the purchase. The price and the performance are always where I go. So the price and performance of the S2500 switches is unbeatable. But what was the closest competitor? That would be the Microtik switches, those cloud switches from Microtik, about 130 bucks brand new. But you either only get two SFP Plus ports on the standard cloud switch, or you buy that new four port one, which isn't rack mount, and I'm kind of, you know, obsessive compulsive disorder, I want everything to be rack mount. And then you only have those four SFP Plus ports and you don't have any real uplinks for your gigabit. So you still have to run two switches. Just one of these switches can completely do everything for your network. You have your four SFP Plus ports for your networking on your high speed side. And then you have your 48 or 24 ports left over for all your standard stuff. So you don't have to worry about running two switches and then uplinking them together. So now that we've showed how to do that, we can go ahead and commit these changes to the switch. And we'll go ahead and fast forward in time here. It doesn't take a whole lot of time to commit to the switch. And once those um, changes have saved, you actually do not have to reboot the switch. They're immediate. So let's talk about the very next catch 22 you're going to come up across. You'll probably figure this out, but just in case you're going to get stuck here, let me tell you what's going to happen. You were in the quick configuration mode and the switch turned into a DHCP server and gave you an IP address. You just configured the switch and it's no longer in that mode and it now has a new IP address, which means your computer is not going to be able to connect to it. If you try to reach that new management IP you gave it, you're going to fail to have communication because now you're no longer on the right subnet. And this time you can't use DHCP to magically get the right one because there's no DHCP services running. So you're going to have to manually go in and change your Ethernet adapter and give yourself a static IP in the right range. So the good news is, if you're still with me at this point, you're pretty much halfway there. Actually, almost all the way there as far as configuring the basics on the switch. With just a factory reset, you could have done a layer 2 dumb switch and just plugged it in and started using it. But you had to go through these steps to at least get your management interface and get in there and manage it. If you bought the switch because you want four 10 gigabit ports, you actually have to do this because those four gigabit ports, only two of them are switching ports. The other two are stacking ports. And if you don't get into the management interface and then into the CLI, you actually cannot disable those stacking ports and turn them into ethernet ports. The other thing, of course, we're gonna cover in this tutorial is upgrading the firmware. So I have already updated it once, but I'm gonna show you where to download it from and how to apply it as well. So let's move along. We'll go ahead and uh, pick up our new IP address. We'll log back into the actual graphic interface for the regular configuration of the switch. This will give us a graphic representation of our switch. It'll show us some of the basic configurations that we can do. Uh, but I will tell you that it's a fairly basic web management and there's not really a whole lot you can do from here. You'll have to go look at the CLI reference guide and then you'll find there's hundreds of commands. But there's still some really cool stuff here. We can see where we're plugged in, we can see our temperatures, our fan speeds, our MAC address table, VLANs. There's still some pretty cool information here. But what I would recommend we do is take this moment in time to go ahead and upgrade our firmware. So my original firmware was 7.1.3.2. That's the one that required the Internet Explorer compatibility mode. If you go to the Aruba website, which I'll put in the description of the video, the newest firmware is 7.4.0.4. And that's what I downloaded and installed originally and what the switch is running right now. It is a dual boot switch, so that's why I can boot to different firmwares. However, HPE, you eventually took over Aruba, and it's actually on the HPE site that you can go search the switch model and find much newer firmware. It's actually very, very current all the way up to the later half of 2018 and still coming out with new firmware. Now for the HPE website, you don't have to have a licensing or anything to download this, unlike a lot of the stuff I do at work. 
but you do have to have an account to download it. So you will have to register for an account to download that firmware. Maybe I'll find a place where I can upload it for you guys to download it a little bit easier. And we can really easily update the firmware here through the web interface. Now this one is gonna take a while. It takes a while to upload that image to the switch. It takes a while to flash it. And unlike committing the original configuration settings, it does require a reboot after that. So while that's running in the background, let's talk about our switch a little bit more. The Aruba S2500 comes in a few different flavors, a 24 port and a 48 port, a PoE and a non-PoE. I found that the switch runs at 45 watts idle, and once I plug in a bunch of devices, about 50 watts. The fans are quiet, uh, but not silent, but definitely not like an enterprise switch you would normally expect to be very loud, like my Cisco switches at work. It's very quiet. It's running right next to me right now, and you don't even hear it. And I've also already learned how to replace the fans, and maybe that'll be a separate video, as well as I fabricated my own ears for it, and maybe that can be a separate video. But uh, the, the money, it was dirt cheap. The performance is amazing. Ubiquity switches were going to cost more to get the connectivity we needed, and I'm actually kind of disappointed in the feature set the Ubiquity switches give me versus this. I mean, I have full layer 3 here, so I can do VLANs, I can do jumbo frames, I can do DHCP. I mean, you can do a lot. You can do a lot of your router features on this switch if you're willing to get in there and learn how to do it. So the PoE switches as well are just dirt cheap. I mean, 400 watts of PoE power on a switch for 100 bucks with management, with 10 gigabit. So that's why these are gonna be what I chose for the 10 gigabit build out and why I'm gonna be recommending to you why you can still get them cheap because I'm sure once it catches on and the eBay stock starts to dwindle, the prices are gonna go up or they're gonna be hard to get. The very next best choice I can say to come up with would be the micro tick switches for home stuff. They're not enterprise grade, however, and they don't have nearly the amount of power and oomph behind these kind of switches but they're gonna be quieter and use a little bit less power, so that's an option for you as well. So here we are back in real time. We can see the switch has come back up. My pings have started to come through, and that should give us the ability to log back into our web interface. We've covered the initial configuration. We've covered how to set this up, how to actually update the firmware. The very last thing that I really need to show you that's important is what I mentioned earlier, how to get into the CLI and configure those stacking interfaces. So as we log back into the web interface, you'll see the two yellow ports on the right-hand side of the switch, which is the very last two SFP plus ports. Those come pre-configured as stacking ports, which means you cannot use them as switching ports. And there's no way to change that from within the web interface. So you would have to go this far along into configuration to get into the CLI. Now I'm a Cisco guy. I actually have my CCNA for routing and switching and CCNA for the cybersecurity. And I'm not super familiar with the Aruba CLI and I'm trying to do this off of memory. So I'll fumble around for a few seconds here, but I'll show you the commands you need. Now this newer firmware seems to let me get right into the SSH right away without any issues. On the older firmware, I remember having to go into the web interface go into my VLANs and set the switch IP to be in my default VLAN so I had a, a gateway to reach the layer three interface with. But now that we're into the SSH, we log in with our administrator password. And of course, once we get into enable mode, we'll need that enable password. And what we wanna do is list out our interfaces and you'll see all the gigabit interfaces. And as we get to the bottom, you'll see those two 10 gigabit interfaces and notice that we don't see four of them. So that's the behavior that I was talking about and what we want to correct. So for me, the Aruba, the way they named the interfaces is really strange, didn't make sense to me. I'm used to seeing TE for 10 gigabit ethernet and Aruba doesn't call it that. And your interfaces, since they're stacking interfaces, they, they changed the interface listing to actually be calling call them stack one and stack three and so we have to use those names when we delete the stacking interfaces. Now what I do like about the Aruba CLI, much like the Cisco, it has the tab completion and the question mark to show you the available commands. So once I 
decided to stop trying to do this from memory and actually use those autocomplete commands, uh, it was actually really easy to figure out the right syntax to delete the stacking interfaces. And once you delete the stacking interfaces, that's it, they're automatically put back into a regular switch port access mode. So we'll do the listing of the interfaces in the CLI to show now we see all four 10 gigabit interfaces. And we'll go refresh our web-based UI as well. And you'll see those yellow stack ports have vanished and now they're standard black switching ports. So with that completed, this pretty much completes what I consider the initial setup of the S2500. It covers all the things that I think are important, the factory reset, the firmware flashing, your IP addressing, your stacking interfaces. From here, you can be on your own. I recommend you do a couple of things like back up your configuration and just take the time to learn some of the ins and outs of the switch, but you should be up and running by now. As far as what this video should be titled, I don't know. Initial configuration or how to fix your 10 gigabit interfaces or why I bought this switch. I kind of crammed a lot of content into one video. So I hope that no matter what reason you were here to watch the video today, that you found it useful, entertaining, and educational. Um, please, if you have any questions, ask down in the comment section below. I'll be happy to answer those questions for you if I know the answer. If not, maybe somebody else will. Let's get together and talk on the YouTube channel and any links, anything that's relevant will be down in the description of the video. Hope you guys enjoyed it. I just want to remind you once again, this is Vicious and I'll see you next time.